Is the universe mathematical? It certainly was for Pythagoras, who lived between 570 and 495 BC. And you may know him by the Pythagoras theorem, by which the square of the hypotenuse of a right angle equals the sum of the squares of the two sides. And he, as you can see, he developed a theorem and I was a mathematical genius, but he says something more than that. He is famous also for, by the phrase that all things are numbers. Um, but this should be considered not that everything is numbers, but everything has a shape, because he was referring to the shapes that collections of objects of specific quantities uh, have, like you, you can see that in the dice, how the the numbers are represented. Um, so basically his ideal world, the perfect world, is mathematical. And Plato has a similar idea, had a similar idea as well. Plato um, lived between 427 BC and 347 BC. And for him there was a distinction between reality and appearance. The world as it appears to us is not the real world. Uh, the world that appears to us is imperfect. It's a copy of the real world. There is a world of ideas that is perfect. The idea of a horse, for example, is perfect. But the horses that we see, we observe, they are imperfect copies of that um, idea. And the same applies to mathematical objects like triangles, circles, squares, etc., in which they, the perfect uh, sh mathematical shapes, um, are in this ideal world, in, in um, as, uh, the world as it, appear, as it appears to us, we can only see imperfect copies of that. Um, that was also uh, fundamental to, um, to, for his theory of knowledge. How can we obtain knowledge? Well, only we can obtain it using our mind, our reason, not our senses, because our sense, by our senses we can only perceive imperfect copies of reality. Only using our mind we can capture um, reality as it is. Okay, so this idea of mathematics was very important in uh, Greek philosophers and, um, and in also developing systems of the universe. Remember, Ptolemy had to add the mathematical structure of epicycles and to the Aristotelian uh, geocentric model of the universe. And Copernicus, this is many, many years later, Copernicus, who lived between 1473 and 1543, um, and published the, the year of his death, the, on the revolution of celestial spheres, a heliocentric model of the world. <laughs> well, this is really, really uh, uh, important because um, going against the authority of Aristotle, that was considered the truth on those on those days. Uh, had consequences for for people. Nothing in this um, model of the universe. The idea of making a simple mathema simpler mathematical structure. The idea of epicycles is not simple, it's not elegant, um, it's not beautiful. The universe cannot be like that. So we need to make it more beautiful, more uh, perfect. And putting the sun on the center of the universe uh, made things uh, easier or more simple, more beautiful. Now we can explain the position of the planets by using a more simple mathematical structure. Now, of course, a Copernican system is not correct either because um, we now know, and you know, we are going to see that later, that this is not how the uh, planets orbit around the Sun. 
but it was a simple mathematical structure. This is very important in the theories of reality that were developed after this um, and even in modern times. Of course, mm, there was something wrong in Copernicus system. He got wrong, he got right, obviously, that the uh, sun was at the center of the, of the not of the universe, but as the, of the solar system. Um, but the orbit was not circular. Kepler uh, developed his laws of planetary motion, and one of them is that the orbit of the planet is an ellipse rather than a circle. Okay, so Galileo Galilei was um, an advocate of Copernicus model. In his dialogue concerning the two chief world systems that was published in 1632, um, so that's before his death, um, he defended Copernicus system in, and compared some when he says the two chief world systems is the Ptolemy system, the Copernicus system, and he advocated for Copernicus one. And see how uh, the scientists of the stature of Galileo, he ignored Kepler's system because it was elliptical. It's not perfect. It hasn't. It doesn't have this elegant mathematical structure. Um, and of course, he had to pay for. Uh, defending Copernicus system and he had to recant and uh, he uh, lived um, the end of his life in house arrest. Um, okay, so he was anti-Aristotelian. He was a, a very fierce um, critic of Aristotle. Uh, okay, so first of all, he said there are atoms in the world that move uh, freely, uh, no purpose in the world. And uh, Galileo also uh, started the um, tradition of doing experiments. He did experiments in inclined, in inclined planes, and based on those experiments, he developed the law of free fall. One thing that is very important in Galileo is that uh, until then, the idea of uh, finding mathematical formulas to explain the movement of bodies, it was only um, for uh, the celestial bodies not for things in Earth. Things in Earth were, uh, have purpose. You, you cannot explain that with a, with a deterministic mathematical formula. But Galileo uh, uh, decided to do that. And one thing that also was influential in science was the idea of thought experiments. The idea of uh, thinking about an experiment that would decide between two theories um, and in some cases by uh, imagining that one is conducting that experiment uh, one can take some um, can rule out some possibilities and um, favor others this is very common in physics today one of the most famous um, theoretic theoreticians in, in physics um, was Albert Einstein. His thought experiments were brilliant and he developed theories uh, based on thought experiments. Another anti-Aristotelian was René Descartes, French philosopher who lived between 1596 and 1650. And we are going to see a lot of Descartes later. But in this uh, lecture I want to talk about his atomism with no void. So he is anti-Aristotelian in the sense that um, there are atoms in the world and everything in the world is uh, composed by atoms. And 
but he, he, he agreed with Aristotle that there is no void, and that would be um, against um, Newton, that we want to see soon. What's, so, if there are atoms and no void, what, what is between the atoms? Well, it is something that he called the ether, and so it has some extension, some mass, it's, it's not a void, no empty space. And René Descartes also um, invented the analytic geometry. So until then, mathematics was geometry. But he started to, um, he realized that he can, uh, for example, describe a line in a plane using um, a mathematical formula, an algebraic formula. And that was uh, the beginning of the use of algebra much more than geometry. Uh, but until then, geometry was the most important tool in mathematics. Okay, so René Descartes saw a universe that is mechanical, and we're going to see that in the next lecture, and uh, mathematical uh, tools to explain the universe were the most fundamental. And if Aristotle was the most famous of the philosophers, the most influential, Isaac Newton was the most influential of the scientists. He lived between 1643 and 1727. His um, most important work was Philosophy Naturalis Principia Mathematica, or, or Principia as it is most famously known, who was, which was published in 1687. There he uh, presented his, the laws of motion, the law of universal gravitation, and he derived Kepler's law of, plan of planetary motion. Um, Kepler presented the, the laws based on um, uh, empirically, so by observations, but Newton generated a system, a mathematical system, and that mathematical system allows to derive um, predictions. So, the, the, the Kepler's uh, laws of planetary motion were derived by the system, mathematical system created by Newton. And if you have to do calculus in school, that was because of Newton. He and Leibniz were the uh, uh, creators of calculus. Now, one very important thing of Newton. So Newton created this, uh, he gave Kepler's system of an elliptical system of orbits around the Sun, a mathematical, a great mathematical uh, formal, formalization, uh, but he was doubtful about whether this mathematical system was an actual description of how reality is, or it was a tool to predict the position of the planets and to understand reality. He Sometimes he thought it was an actual description of reality, and sometimes he thought it was just a tool, a predictive tool. And I'd like to finish this video with uh, two postures in physics at the moment. Um, one is, which is the most um, popular among theoretical physicists and quantum physicists, which is um, exemplified by Max Tegmark's uh, book, Our Mathematical Universe, in which there is the idea of uh, four levels of parallel universes, and those uh, this with this uh, with varying degrees of mathematical formality. So basically, the idea is that it's like Plato, the universe is mathematical. But Sabine Hosenfelder in 2018 uh, wrote the book Lost in Math: How Beauty Leads Physics Astray in which she's an instrumentalist, so she thinks that the mathematics 
are very useful tools to uh, understand reality, to make predictions about things that happen in reality, but not that the reality is mathematical. So uh, this is a, a discussion. So the idea that mathematics is a tool is the minority, but it's the one that I support. And the idea that the universe is mathematical, a platonic universe, it's very strong in physics.